it is 7 35 p.m on monday april 17th 2023 uh good evening my name is christian klein i am the chair of the arlington zoning board of appeals and i'm calling this meeting of the board to order i ask all attendees who are not recognized by the chair to please mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair i would like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present uh members of the zoning board of appeals uh roger dupont here is here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Daniel Riccardelli. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam Blank. Here. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good evening, Colleen. Um, and then I don't believe we have anyone here on behalf of the um, Department of Planning and Community Development um, or any other de uh, department. Uh, the consultants for the board, we have uh, Paul Hafferty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, sir. Um, and our other two consultants, uh, Sean Reardon and Cliff Bomer are unavailable this evening. So they will not be joining us. Um, and then appearing on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have Paul Feldman. Good evening. Good evening. And I see we have Matt Majurius here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. We also have Paul Majuri and Jackie Majuri joining us as well. Good evening. Good evening. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue meet, holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may re meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. We are now turning to uh, item two on our agenda, which is the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook to be located at 1021, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. This evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office B1 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. At the January hearings, the board heard testimony regarding wetlands and stormwater plans for the property, traffic and transportation issues, and architectural considerations. At the February hearings, the board heard testimony regarding landscape plans, revisions to the civil plans, revisions to the architectural plans, and presentation of the construction management plan. At the March hearing, the board heard testimony regarding the applicant's Wetland Protection Act application before the Conservation Commission, revisions to the construction management plan, the historic status of the building at 1021 Mass Ave, and the revised waiver request from the applicant. Tonight, we plan to discuss progress of the Applicant's Wetland Protection Act application before the Conservation Commission, the applicant's <clears throat> status before the Historic Commission, and possible conditions for the board's decision. After members of the board have an opportunity to ask their questions to the applicant, the hearing will be open for public comment and questions on the topics discussed this evening. 
The board is reaching the end of the scheduled hearings for this project. Under state law, as extended by the consent of the applicant, the public hearing phase of this project must conclude before April 30th, 2023. The board will hear public comment at this session on topics related to the materials presented this evening. Comments from the public, which do not specifically relate to topics under discussion this evening, are important to the board, and we request that those comments be submitted by email to the board for consideration. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will discuss whether there is need for an additional session, and if so, discuss options for further extension of the public hearing period with the applicant before a vote to continue the hearing and adjourn for the evening. So at this point, I would like to introduce attorney Paul Feldman from Davis Mom D'Augustine to introduce tonight's presenters. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the Zoning Board. Paul Feldman on behalf of the applicant. Um, tonight, um, the only presenters are going to be myself and uh, Matt Mashiori from uh, Mashiori uh, Construction. Um, let me begin by uh, the first couple of um, the, um, items that the chair just made reference to, the status of some of our hearings in front of other municipal boards. Um, with regard to Conservation Commission, um, when we were here last, we have already had our first Conservation Commission hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, that hearing was continued until last week. Um, and in between the continued hearing, the Conservation Commission conducted a site visit. Um, so the site visit was conducted. The Conservation Commission um, had additional requests for information that it wanted the applicant to respond to. And at the hearing last week, um, we submitted our responses to those open information questions. Um, the, uh, our wetlands expert that presented before this board, Richard Kirby, you know, answered any follow-up questions. And um, at the conclusion of the CONCOM public hearing last week, uh, two things occurred. One was the board, the Conservation Commission uh, appeared to indicate that they had no additional questions, that they were looking for additional information from the applicant. Um, the second thing was that the Conservation Commission continued the public hearing on the request for an order of conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act until this Thursday, April 20th. And the third thing, the chair asked the Conservation Commission agent to prepare um, <clears throat> a draft order of conditions, um, which would contain both general conditions and special conditions that the Conservation Commission thought was important if it decided to move ahead with a order of conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act. And, and, um, and so uh, we have an expectation that the uh, public hearing um, process is going to close on Thursday, April 20th, um, after which time the Conservation Commission is then going to, you know, I think they'll actually vote whether or not to issue or deny a order of conditions on the 20th, but they may not issue the exact order of conditions for a couple weeks thereafter. The reason why the chair um, <clears throat> asked that some condition, the conditions be prepared is we talked about the coordination that we were trying to accomplish between the zoning board's um, decision-making authority under the local bylaw and the Conservation Commission's authority under the State Wetlands Protection Act to try to get, you know, conditions that would conform and that if the Conservation Commission was inclined to issue an order of conditions and then set forth all of their conditions, we can, uh, you know, they could be adopted wholesale um, under for, by the zoning board. And to the extent there were anything else under the local act, that the zoning board needed to do, it would then be just add, add those, add those local conditions. So that's the that's where we are with the conservation commission. Our expectation is that the hearing will close on Thursday the twentieth. There will be draft conditions available, and there will be draft conditions, uh, or and, the, and there will be an order of conditions if it gets issued for this board to have during its decision writing period. 
which I know is a, about a 30 or 40 day period after April 30th. So I think where uh, the coordination that we attempted to start a couple months ago or three months ago it seems to be working out. Let me pause there to see if there's any questions on CONCOM. I'm happy to respond. Um, <clears throat> no, it sound, sounds very positive. Um, and so you had just a clarify, I think that um, this Thursday, maybe the, the conclusion of the, the public hearings on that and that it may, that all the Conditions may not be finalized that evening. They may require some additional time. Is that essentially correct? Well, I think the expectation is, is that they want to, the reason why they asked David Morgan to draft conditions is they want to go through them. Uh, and if they're then going to vote, they will vote and they will vote those conditions. But, you know, the, 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 the I don't know if they're actually going to issue the final order of mm -hmm. conditions on the 20th. They typically take some period of time a um, couple of weeks after, you know, they vote to issue the order of conditions, but an order of conditions, if they approve it, will be available to the ZBA, you know, right at the outset of your decision writing period. So you're not going to be waiting on them. Um, you, you'll have their work product to consider um, when you guys are considering your own decision. Great, thank you. Excuse me, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just have to, a little follow-up. Um, I take it that if between the 20th and two weeks after the 20th, it's possible for CONCOM to change its mind on the exact formulation of the commissions that presumably they want that extra time to do something. Isn't that right? Um, the sense that I got was they weren't sure if David was going to have the time to prepare a complete order of conditions for the 20th. Um, I think what they wanted to see David do is at least put together the order of conditions that would be considered special conditions that are unique to this project so that they can be considered and discussed with the applicant. Um, so I wouldn't expect there to be um, conditions that would be in the order of conditions um, that would ultimately issue if they were inclined to grant an order of conditions, that would be objectionable to the applicant. Yes, I'm looking at it from a slightly different point of view is that if there were changes that took place, I mean, if they do this on the 20th and they really take literally two weeks, that takes us past April 30th and we have to put our hands over our ears on April 30th. And so whatever we, we won't be able to take, we won't be able to take uh, uh, into account any changes that occur. And I'm just, I'm, I'm guessing that there won't be anything big that would happen and that probably that's not a problem, but I just want to surface that because in terms of the timing, that slight difference and the possibility of slight differences in the language could introduce potential inconsistencies where we have version one and they have version two of the same condition. So I'm not sure exactly what to do about that, but we we ought not to put ourselves in a position where something like that happens just from snafu. Yeah, I, I thought, Mr. Hanlon, that what the ZBA was going to do, it was going to make as a condition of its uh, approval, if it chose to vote for an approval, that we had to comply with the order of conditions issued by the Conservation Commission under the Wetlands Protection Act. I didn't expect you guys to rewrite every one of the conditions so that whatever that final language is, that's what we're going to be uh, required to comply with under your decision. So I didn't think you really needed um, you know, every uh, uh, that we needed to see it exactly in final form because you're just going to reference the the order of conditions and whatever it is, it is. It's then it's we're going to comply with it. So that's why I didn't think that few days mattered. The, what I was really interested in and what the Conservation Commission Commission uh, seemed to be okay about is, you know, they wanted to make sure that there was a a condition on maintenance of invasive species, for example. 
because that's a specific condition that they were interested in. So our consultant has submitted something for them to consider so that we can get that squared away on Thursday night. And as this board knows, and as this board has requested, there's a condition on 10 years of monitoring um, of the, of the uh, woodland restoration. And we have prepared our, we asked our consultant to prepare a, a proposed condition for both the CONCOM and the ZBA on that exact subject um, so that you guys can consider uh, a specific condition because it's, it's much easier for you to look at a condition and edit it than to just, you know, create one from whole cloth where you don't know where anyone's coming from. So we... We've done those. We've done those conditions that we've been talking about in front of this board and in front of the Conservation Commission. And, you know, when we get to a little later in the meeting, when we get to the uh, draft decision that Mr. Haverty prepared, I was going to suggest how we can get that stuff for you guys to start to consider. So those types of conditions, with Hamlin, I think we're going to have hammered out on Thursday night. But there's some other more generic conditions that you know we may not have hammered out but it'll just be in the order of conditions okay, thank you thank you yeah i think from the board's perspective we just want to make sure if we have if we have conditions and concom has conditions on the same topic that we are in agreement and that we don't have we don't accidentally create a conflict between the two And just a question for Mr. Haverty. I think that um, the board would need to receive the final uh, order of conditions from the CONCOM before we close the public hearing, correct? If the board wants to take it into consideration in its decision, yes. Okay. Um, to the extent that the Conservation Commission decision is rendered after the board closes the public hearing, then you know it's really the applicant's risk as to whether or not there are conditions in the board's decision that conflict with the conservation commission decision, in which case they'd have to try to get a, a modification of your decision. Okay. The you know, one thing I could suggest is that chances are we're, we're going to have another hearing before this board before the April before April three. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and I presume we're not going to finish tonight. So, um, and we're going to go to CONCOM on the on the on the 20th. So if it turns out, you know, that we they are able to complete their decision and issue it in final form before the 30th, we'll know that, you know, at our next meeting with you guys. And if it turns out it's a few days longer, I'll talk to my client about extending seven days so that or, or whatever it is, so that we don't run into the issues that 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 people seem to be concerned about. But we could we could we could make those decisions at the next uh, the next time we meet. We're open to that, and let's everybody's on the same page trying to um, complete the process in a timely way. So let's see where we end up. Okay. Um, have you heard anything from the historic commission? Yeah, so I'll, I'll report on the historic commission. So um, at the last hearing, we presented information to the ZBA on the research that we did because um, we were asking for the ZBA to make a determination that uh, there, there, there really isn't a, a need for construction delay. We explained at the last hearing why. Um, I think it was Mr. Hanlon who suggested that he really did want to at least give the Historic Commission an opportunity to provide information to the zoning board. Um, and I know, um, I believe, uh, Mr. Klein, that you reached out to the, to the, uh, to the Historic Commission advising them, look, we're, we're considering this issue. If you have anything that you want to address, please get us information and, and, and make it available to the ZBA. Uh, what happened was the Historic Commission did hold a hearing um, since our last meeting. It invited the owner of the property uh, to attend the hearing to present, um, you know, 
the owner's view, or in our case, the applicant's view of why we thought the uh, meeting wasn't his, uh, uh, the, the, the the construction delay wasn't necessary. And when I heard that, um, I, I reached out to town council um, because um, I was concerned that the historic commission was holding a hearing on subject matter that is in the purview of this board. And uh, I just wanted the town council, Doug Heim, to know that 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 uh, meeting is going on and that I didn't feel that it was appropriate for the applicant to attend that hearing and start a proceeding in front of the historic commission. Um, and the property owner didn't want to go either. And um, I had drafted an email so that we weren't just snubbing the historic commission. We, we, we were explaining to the historic commission where we weren't. I, and I wanted to review it with the town council first. And I did. And and town council concurred that it's it would it, it, that that we shouldn't be participating in a second public hearing process when that we are before the ZBA in a comprehensive permit process um, and um, and and so uh, we we sent the email saying look whatever information you'd like to provide the zoning board on the historic um, significance please just. Do whatever you want to do. Send in the information, and we'll 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 discuss it at the at the ZBA. We we uh, I did send to the historic commission with that email, or I should say, the property owner did send to the historic commission with that email the uh, historic information cards that I had referenced to this board that we had reviewed. Uh, we sent those to the board, saying, "Look, here are, here are the historic information." And it, there's there's really nothing remarkable in in the in in that record. We they, we did we, I did see an email um, thanking um, the property owner for sending that, so they didn't have to go hunt around for it. It was immediately available to them. Uh, but I don't know what happened at the at the meeting that was held because I wasn't in attendance, and I don't know if there's been communication uh, to the ZBA. Um, I, so I have a little info on that. Well, I can report on that. I could I could follow up, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the uh, the property owner uh, just out of courtesy decided to sit in on the meeting, although mm -hmm. he didn't have much to add. Um, the historic commission was appreciative that they they did actually show up, um, and basically uh, the long long or the short of it is that they were going to send a letter to the ZBA, which you may not have yet, mm -hmm. um, basically saying that as long as um, you know as long as this permit is going to be issued through the 40B process, uh, then it doesn't conflict with the commit the, the commission's reading of the bylaw. So I think okay. at the end of the day, we ended up in, in the place where we thought we were going to end up. Um, but I think they just wanted to feel like they were part of the process, which which we um which we are fine with and which we which we accommodated. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, so those are where we, those are the, uh, meetings that were held with other, uh, boards that have jurisdiction. Um, let me just go through a couple of quick items that were open items from our last meeting. So we could sort of close them off. One of the questions was, will the bike racks that were hanging in the garage have an assist mechanism? Uh, the chair was kind enough to send a, um, an example of what type of bike rack, um, uh, uh, he had he had in mind. We've reviewed it with the architect. Um, the 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 answer is for the bike racks that we're going to put in the garage. We weren't going to try to have a, a an assist mechanism. They they are a much larger bike rack. They're going to take up room that's going to interfere potentially with the parking of the car. Um, we have forty nine. Um, bike racks in the basement that don't require any lifting or any um, uh, effort whatsoever. Uh, they're elevator access. So uh, it, it didn't make sense to us for the 26 racks that we were going to hang that we make them uh, have some kind of assist mechanism, which makes the, the whole unit much great, much, much larger. Um, I think it was the architect who said, most bicyclists are fit enough to be able to lift their bicycle and, and put it on the rack. Um, not, I'm sure that's not always the case, but um, for the but we're going to have 49 accessible 
bike racks that uh, are going to be available. And if it turns out that that someone really needs to just be able to have access without having to lift the bike, I'm sure the condo association is going to be able to accommodate that. Um, so that's where we came down on on what type of bike rack. Okay. Um, the the next one, the next open item was the commission wanted us to provide a um, proposed condition on the monitoring report. I'll, I'll get to that when we talk about the decisions. We have something. Uh, the next item that was open from last time was that um, the board wanted to confirm that uh, the the generator that we would, that we need to have, which would be powered by natural gas. Uh, to provide emergency power for the elevator system, um, that that's going to run on a on a once a week cycle, and uh, and only once a week. And um, we don't we we would prefer that we don't have a specific condition that says it's going to run on a certain day at a certain time, but. Uh, we'd like, uh, but if the board wants to have a condition that says it'll it'll run on a weekly cycle, a once a week cycle, I mean that's perfectly fine. But um, you know, we obviously want to do it at a time when it's least disruptive. So if that ends up being a a weekend afternoon or a weekday afternoon, we sort of let them with the condominium association to guide us on when they want the unit to run. And um, one other one other point of clarification, you know, this unit would be roof mounted. It sits on um, an, a curb with vibration isolation. Um, it would be very unlikely that you would even hear it running. Um, and the vibration isolation is uh, a system that uh, doesn't allow that vibration to transfer back to the building. Um, so we don't anticipate any, um, certainly not going to hear it from street level. Um, we don't anticipate um any nuisance and noise or vibration um, in the living levels uh, either. Okay. Uh, the, the next item was that- uh, um, Paul, Paul, sorry, just to go back to the, the question about bikes. Um, sure. The number of bike spaces shown in the basement level is 48, not 49. Um, okay, I should check with the architect because he specifically told me 49, but I didn't count them. So I, I but we'll, we'll, we'll double check that. Okay. Um, we'll make sure we get that correct. Thank you. Um, with re the next item was that <clears throat> there was a request made that on our uh, construction management plan, um, we specifically call out on the plan itself uh, the the private streets that are immediately in the location of our property. Um, with a pro with it and call out the prohibition that there is no parking of cars on private streets. So that in the construction management plan diagram, when someone is looking at the preferred route, route and and other and you know that that diagram that we have, it's actually called out on that diagram. So that changes in process. Um, uh, I know Matt, you're 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 on that. Um, um, I've I've added a note to the CMP um, that was submitted this evening uh, in the note section under um, truck routes that uh, parking on that private street that's just to the south of us um, mm -hmm. is prohibited at all times. Great, thank you. Yeah, and the, and and while we're on the subject of the construction management plan, at the last hearing uh, we had submitted a revised plan taking into account the uh, comments that we had from an interdepartmental meeting, um, but we had not yet heard feedback. Um, but with the assistance of the chair uh, who asked for the uh, the town engineer in particular to, to weigh in and, uh, you know, to, and give us feedback, the town engineer did respond to us that he was satisfied with the revised construction management plan and he um, he uh, published his view to all the other town departments and boards, um, you know, with the suggestion that if they have something to weigh in any further, they weigh they, that they that they should weigh in. So, uh, if you haven't heard anything, it's I think because the last iteration of the construction management plan uh, that uh, Matt submitted to the board today. 
is the construction management plan that we uh, understand to be satisfactory to the town engineer. And as again, when we get to the decision, as I'm suggesting that construction management plan be an exhibit to the decision and that we be required to comply with it. Um, so we'll, 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 uh, we, we, we sort of close that loop. Um, we, uh, I don't know if it made it into the, I don't remember now if uh, I deleted it from the proposed decision, but we concluded that we no longer needed a parking waiver because of some zoning changes. So we had a parking waiver request, but we're now compliant with parking. And the last item was someone asked um, if <clears throat> we could find ourselves um, making a, an additional contribution to street trees. And we said that we would consider that. And we had a, 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 a lengthy discussion about it. And um, here's where we ended up coming down. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of mitigation that is, you know, I think technically and legally not required. And in particular to, to illustrate, um, in order to mitigate our requests for the disturbance in the riverfront area, we have to do a, do a two to one uh, mitigation. We're doing like a three and a half to one mitigation. So we completely comply with our legal requirement. But the Conservation Commission said it would really be meaningful if we can do an added enhancement to um, address some area on the Millbrook condominium property that we don't own that was immediately adjacent to the brook. And we have undertaken to do that. And we have a plan and we have worked out an access agreement, although I'm constantly hounding the lawyer to get the signed version back to me and we just can't seem to get it. It's fully negotiated and fully agreed upon. We're just trying to get the signature so we can give it to you guys. Um, and um, and so there's just so many extra dollars of, um, of, uh, of this applicant going above and beyond that we that we 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 just did could not see ourselves now just adding whatever dollars it is to a street a street a street tree fund even though we're not saying that because we don't understand its importance to the town. But I did want to say, so we're not just doing nothing here, that there was a made, there was a comment made at the last public hearing by a member of the public, I don't know who it was, about the sycamore tree that is going to be taken down. And that's sort of a, a majestic tree that that, you know, has some significance. And, you know, could the uh, applicant find a way to just not, you know, dump that tree? And so what, uh, what Matt um, has indicated is as follows. Assuming the tree, when it comes down, doesn't, is, is in a condition to be uh, reused or we claim we can reclaim some wood out of it, we were going to build the benches that, we, that you see on the plan um, next to the bus stop. Um, out of the wood from that sycamore tree so that it would still have a presence on the site, although it would have a presence on the site in a different form. But that was sort of the suggestion of the, of the member of the public as a, as a way to do that. And, and depending upon the, the, the tree when it comes down and its, and its internal condition and, and, can it, and, and can it be mined for usable wood, uh, Majority Construction is also willing to um, you know, donate that wood to a local furniture maker who would want to make useful products from that wood. Um, so we would just want to, you know, suggest that those people that are interested in, in seeing that uh, the sycamore tree, you know, reclaimed in some way, um, you, know, uh, you know, find a local furniture maker who would have interest in it, and then we'll try to coordinate if there is wood available, how to how to get it to that person. The only thing I would ask the commission on uh, the ZBA on this type of item is that I wouldn't want it to be fashioned into a condition. I mean, it's the 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 applicant is is 
saying this is what we're going to do because he in, intends to do it. We're going to build the benches if the wood is available. You know, if you don't open it up and there's no disease or something in the tree, so you know you could use the wood. Um, um, but, you know, the, it's the type of thing that, you know, best laid plans with the person who's cutting the trees down and our subcontractors, you know, something gets missed and, you know, there's a snafu, we, would, we wouldn't want to be in violation of a condition. So we would ask that the commission uh, understand our intention, our desire to recognize that tree and we don't turn it into a, a condition, but that's, that's what we were thinking. Those were our thoughts about the sycamore tree, that we could at least do two things. One is make the benches out of it, and to the extent that there was wood available, make it available to a to a furniture maker in Arlington that desires to have it. Great, thank you. Uh, so those were the open items that I had on the list. And then the, the last subject is um, we received a draft decision from Mr. Har Harity. And first of all, let me thank Mr. Harity for preparing it because, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work and it, and it takes a lot of energy. And um, I, we have gone through the decision and I, I have a red line, which I will uh, present back to Mr. Harity tomorrow. Um, and so ultimately, you know, it'll be able to get to the zoning board, you know, before this process is completed. Um, the red line does two things. One thing it does is it just cleans up some of the facts that we're much more familiar with than Mr. Haverty would be, would be familiar with and clean those things up and he can review exactly how we clean them up so that we present the facts correctly. Um, uh, the other thing that we did is we added some conditions that we know we've talked about with the ZBA that um, he may not have just focused on or been tuned into. Um, he picked up a lot of the conditions for sure, but uh, the two most important was a condition on the 10-year monitoring and, uh, and a condition on um, invasive species maintenance. And so both of those are in this red wine version. I, I can, um, um, I, I, they were prepared by our consultants. They made sense to me. It, it was the type of condition that I would expect to see in the decision. So I'll get those to Mr. Haverty and, and to you guys. What I did want to do tonight, if the board is, uh, uh, would, would think it's, it's worthwhile is just, point out some conditions that were presented that um, we would like to, um, you know, you know, change in this form so that we could have a discussion about some of them so you can understand where we're, where we're coming from on those. On those. Um, I'll leave it up to the board. Would you rather get the red line first um, and then I guess discuss it at the next hearing or would you like to hear some of the items that we wanted to bring up. There, there aren't many, frankly. Um, okay. There's not a ton of red lines in this decision, to be frank. I mean, it's it was a well-drafted decision, and we'll get our comments back to you guys. Okay. Well, the I know I've put together a list of a red line this set as well, and I think this, uh, excuse me, Mr. Hanlon has probably as well. Um, and so I'm not sure we should put all of this on Mr. Haverty to try to hash between all the different versions. Um, so uh, I guess my question to the, is sort of what would be the best way at this point, um, whether it makes sense for Mr. Feldman to present his, um, his proposed changes, and then maybe the board discusses some of those, and then the board present, then I could present some of the ones that I think um, we may want to consider, or whether we should basically hash the versions first and come up with something that has a bit of everything in it. And then, excuse me, try to review that um, going forward. I'm not sure what's going to be the, the best at this stage. I, I, I'll defer to Mr. Haberty first of all to see if he has a thought on that. I, I don't really have a preference. Um, we can go through whatever the changes are proposed tonight, or we can wait and take a look at the, the red line and address it at another time. 
you know, if the board, if the board has, look, we're, 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 you're here, you're, you're taking Patriots Day to, to have a public meeting. And if you have some stamina, I wouldn't mind just pointing out a few of the ones that, you know, are going to have to be, uh, you know, we, we want to uh, weigh in on. And, and um, there, there are not that many, and I could just go through them real quickly. And, and, and I'm sure maybe the board can give some guidance mm -hmm. to everybody uh, when, I, when I bring them up. Um, you want me to give you an example of one? For example, I'll give you a real easy one. Uh, okay. There's a limitation on construction start, eight o'clock on a weekday, yep. to, uh, ending at six o'clock, and on a weekend, nine o'clock to five. Mm -hmm. um, the the challenge is is that almost the entire construction industry in Massachusetts is built on a seven a.m. start time, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. usually a four o'clock or five o'clock quitting time. Um, and so to start at eight o'clock in the morning, um, really, would, it, it just doesn't work or make sense to to us. Uh, every virtually every project um, um, in the Commonwealth has a has a limitation where you start at seven. And I know that must have been in another decision because um, uh, Mr. Haberty made reference. Oh, this was the start time that the yeah. board used at at another ZBA uh, decision. Um, but um, we would really ask that for our for our decision, the board uh, the board start time is consistent with what the construction trade is is typically used to in the hours that they typically work. And and then the, the nine o'clock start time on a Saturday, um, we would we would basically be counting out a Saturday in our schedule. And you know these projects rely, um, especially once you're interior. Um, doing finishes, um, there, there's a whole slew of trades that, um, you know, like to work on the weekends. And, um, you know, if it's not a disturbance um, to the public or to the neighbors, um, you know, they'd be able to get in. Uh, but if you're telling them they can't start till nine, they'll never show up. So we would we would yeah. ostensibly lose um, every Saturday um, because people aren't, aren't willing. They're willing to come in and, and you know, blow out a morning, but they're not mm -hmm. going to come in at nine o'clock. Okay, so those hours are in the town bylaws. Um, so that's where they're coming from. They're from uh, the Title Five. Um, it's the noise of beams. I think it's five, five twelve three. I think is where it is in the town bylaws. Um, so if you and it relates specifically to um, to work that's outdoors um, and large equipment. So. Uh, I would encourage you to to review that section of the town bylaw and determine if you need to request a waiver. Um, okay, because I, the um, changing of those hours to other hours would require a waiver. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, uh, let me just because I I went through all the bylaws and I may have missed it, but do I have a waiver request on that one already? Um, I no no. Uh, Okay. All right. So let, let's do that. So that's going to be an important one that we'll come back to you guys on. I'm glad we, we brought it up here. We have to request a waiver then. Uh, that I, I know that's something we're going to be interested in in requesting. Yeah. Um, the, the next example of a proposed change that we have that, that was is a little bit significant is that in the draft decision, the construction management plan was contemplated to be prepared at a at a later date. We went through um, doing the construction management plan as part of this process because the buildability of the project was an issue raised by the review consultants, and this board wanted to understand how we were going to accomplish that, and the review consultant wanted to review it, and all of that has occurred. So we and now we have the town engineer signing off on it. So we want to substitute that that condition as it was drafted, uh, that we would prepare such a plan and what we would do with it and when we would do it to indicate that the plan has been prepared, it's attached as an exhibit, it would be exhibit B, um, and that we're obligated to conform to, to that plan. It's been, a, the plan's been approved and we're obligated to conform to it. So you'll see that kind of proposed uh, uh, change. Uh, the other thing we wanted to reference is that there are a couple of conditions where when we submit subsequent materials to the 
director of uh, planning and community development or town departments that there's a 45 day period for a response. Uh, we really like to request that that period be shortened. Um, you know, the, the, um, the work that we've done through this public hearing process has been so thorough and so detailed and we've frankly hammered out things that uh, are even beyond the schematic level um, that we don't fully expect there to be, yes, there has to be final drawings and final construction drawings, but you know, they're just gonna to conform to what's been what's been um, uh, uh, presented on our approved plans that we'd like to see that that period shortened to 15 days. It really becomes cum cumbersome at, at, at 45. So you'll see that in our request. Um, it shows up in a couple of places. And, and there's one place where um, there's contemplations that inspections inspections will be done um, and there'll be um, uh, third party uh, uh, third parties doing it and there'll there'll be need to be some fees spent and that's another one we don't understand. We would expect inspections uh, to be done by the municipality. This is this is there's nothing. This is a pretty standard building and it's a a pretty straightforward construction and. Uh, we we pay all these building permit fees that that that's that's very very expensive and it and it's designed to fund and part of it is designed to fund the inspections and so we wouldn't want to have to pay twice so we would ask that we not be subject to third party review on inspections and um, so you'll 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 see that um, as a as a as a proposed uh, a change. Um, we um, there, there's a couple of references to snow removal and snow removal plans. I think you know, that that it, it, again because this was modeled after a different project where there probably was a lot of snow removal issues. Um, they just they're just not applicable. We just don't think those those uh, conditions are applicable on our project. The the only thing we have is the 20 feet of driveway between the street and the, and going into our garage. That's the only snow removal that we really have on this site. And, and so there isn't, you know, snow removal plans and snow removal storage areas and, and things like that. If, if the board wants to put in a condition that we shouldn't um, store snow in any resource area, we get that. That's in the back of the building. We're not going to be doing anything back there anyway. So for snow removal. So, um, uh, so you'll see you'll see cases like that that we thought were just not applicable to to uh, our project. Then then there was the the um, uh, condominium documents. Uh, I proposed a change in uh, um, you know what it is that we're asking town council to review or special council to review in the condominium documents um, to really specify that you want to make sure that. What you have in the condominium documents is that they're subject to this condition, uh, to this decision. I mean, and 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 if there's a particular special condition uh, for um, for how they have to conduct themselves, that it's called out in the condominium documents. And so, that's the extent of the review. That those things that you would expect that you would want to see in the condo documents are there, not like review with the condo documents. Um, so that I made some minor suggested language changes on, on that particular condition. Um, there was reference to the, uh, the board wants a property management plan um, uh, and, and, the, and, and, a con and a contact with a management company. Um, we, we didn't think that was an appropriate condition. Uh, we, we don't know, I mean, look, we fully expect the condominium association is gonna hire a company that's gonna help them manage their condominium, but that's gonna be up to the condominium association on how they wanna organize themselves and run themselves. I mean, we know in our 50 unit building, they're gonna have a management company do it, but we, we didn't think it made sense that you know, in a comprehensive permit that they'd be required to, you know, provide a copy of the contract of the, uh, with the management company 
um, if it's a third party to the board, for, for what purpose? Why, why, why is that um, uh, a condition of this permit? It, it didn't, it didn't make, it didn't make sense to us. Um, the, 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 the way the condition was written is that we were going to submit to the board all information relating to issues of building security and public access that, that they may adopt as part of their rules and regulations. Again, um, that, those types of operational issues that are not related to, to conditions of the uh, of the board in terms of you know um, what we've been addressed, we, we didn't think was appropriate. Now I didn't I didn't remove it. I did say that we would submit we would give you a copy of the rules and regulations that the condominium association is is adopting. You know for things like their pet policy and their trash removal, but. Again, I, I thought that, that the condition as drafted just seemed not to make sense to us. Um, so you'll see a proposed change on that. Um, uh, there was, um, yeah, I, you'll see a small change. The, the, there's a condition that the applicant's gonna permit representatives of the board to observe and inspect the properties in construction progress until it's completed. Um, I, you'll see a small change where I just said upon reasonable notice and subject to construction activity. If if they're hoisting steel or something like that, we're not gonna want board members to come to have access that day. It's just not, it wouldn't be a safe thing. So I need to put some kind of, um, you know, modification to to that um, uh, representative board access. It's not that we're not going to provide it. Of course, the board wants to come and see the progress. You're you're entitled to see it. We're not resisting it. It just we just want to have notice and make sure it's on a day when the nature of the construction activity is. It's just wouldn't wouldn't be safe to have people trouncing around the building. That's all. Um, so that's a small little change that 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 you're going to see. Uh, I talked about the hours already. Um, uh, you know, uh, here's a, um, uh, uh, a snow removal I, I spoke about. Uh, catch basins. There was a requirement that all cage catch basins have oil water separators. Um, you'll see me modify that to say any catch basins that receive runoff from vehicles should have water, oil, water, oil, oil, water separators. There, there are going to be a couple of catch basins or structures in the storm water management system, particularly in the back, that they're not going to have oil water separators in it because they're not going to receive any water that's okay. going to be other than either roof water or it's not going to have any water that's going to have contact with vehicles. So. We we you know we cleaned up something like that um, because the condition was a little bit too uh, broadly uh, articulated. Um, on emergency vehicle access, um, everybody knows that an emergency vehicle is not going to be able to go down the two side yards, and um, so I we changed that language to to say that the applicant shall ensure that emergency personnel. As you will recall, we added that uh, emergency access gate from the Millbrook parking lot um, and a path that you could uh, come into the property from behind as well as from uh, Mass Ave. So again, I just modified that language a little bit to suit our particular project. I don't know if that was just an articulation from you know the nature of the of a of a different uh, development. Um, there was a reference to standpipes shall be operational on each floor during construction uh, as required by the building code of fire department. We don't think there's a building code requirement that standpipes be operational during construction for a building like this. There are certainly you know, high rise towers in Boston where that's required, but uh, that would be a very complicated um, requirement for us to meet. So, You'll you'll see the uh, a suggested deletion there. Um, reference to fire hydrants. We don't have any fire hydrants on this in this particular development that we're putting in. So we we deleted the reference to uh, to, to fire hydrants. And and you'll see that 
Um, we um, uh, we did a more complete job of presenting the facts associated with the riverfront area, how many square foot of disturbance, how many square foot of, of, of mitigation stuff that Mr. Haverty, uh, it would be a detail he'd have to go through the record and try to pull out that was just readily available for us. So we, we, we put it in so that, you know, it was clear uh, everything that was being um, required of us. Um, I think I hit all the, the highlights, but you can tell from my comments that the nature of our changes were rather minor and, um, and, uh, uh, we, we are well on our way to having a decision that we don't find objectionable. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I took, took notes, I think, of most of those. Um, you mentioned the work hours, that, as I said, that that comes out of the, 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 um, the town bylaws. So I just encourage you to, to review. It's the noise... Uh, it's the noise abatement ordinance, which I think is Title Five, Section Twelve. Um, I mean, Title Five, Article Twelve. Um, but it, I think that's where that is. Um, the the note on CMP completion that makes sense. Um, the forty five day review period. Um, so cutting that down to fifteen days um, feels a little stringent. Um, I think in the past. The board has changed that to 30 days on some projects. Um, I would need to confirm the, the text on that. Um, but I will discuss that um, with planning and with the ISD um, to get their, their input on that. So, you know, the last thing we want to do is put a time period in there that um, you know would cause the bill you know, and either of those or, uh, departments to be you know, yeah. unable to respond in time and uh, things get out ahead of them. Yeah, For, in one of the conditions um, we did propose 30 days. I mean, that you have two different conditions. They do two different things. The one where we asked for 15 days, it seemed like it should be easy enough for the director of planning to respond within a two week period. But the one that had us submit final plans for approval, um, mm -hmm. that we said was 30 days, which is consistent with the time period that a uh, building commissioner has on the law to issue a building permit. So we we just okay. made those two time periods conform. So we didn't do, uh, we didn't go to 15 days twice. So you'll okay. see that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I just wanted to mention so that we all are focused on it. When we've used uh, these conditions in the past, um, we have taken the view and expressed them clearly to applicants that a response doesn't necessarily mean that the answer finally addresses the issue. It may very well be that a response is we need more time to address it. So uh, basically the obligation is to not just sit there silent and wait for the time to expire and not do anything at all. But it, it, the language doesn't say, and, and we have not interpreted to require that the response be something that subsequently resolves the issue. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the question on inspections and third party fees, I think in the past we've included um, subsequent language that essentially it's that that would only be used where there is not a town agency having expertise in the area of requiring review. Um, and so that would come in if, uh, you know, when you're doing, when you're pouring your concrete and the, there needs to be testing of the concrete, slump testing and things like that, that those would be billed back to, you know, that those would need to be paid for. Um, typically they're paid for by the by the owner, but if, if for some reason those were, being put back on the town that the town would then um you know bill the applicant for those kinds of those kinds of testing services that are not a part of the the town but certainly the review of the drawings by inspectional services the review of drawings by the different departments that that would be you know as long as it's within their normal purview of of business that it would not be a 
be something that would be subbed out. So maybe, maybe that language is going to work. Um, I, I know that. Go ahead, Matt. Well, the, the third third party testing, you know, for us as a matter of course, you know, gets paid for by the the, the general contractor. Um, so for you know, concrete testing verification that you're you know tying steel appropriately uh, or rebar appropriately, that your um, that your um, 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 inspection of um, uh, uh, soils, uh, be, you know, before placing concrete, things of that nature is you know all done by third party testing companies um, through the general contractor. Uh, further, we have um, engineers, you know, completing uh, control construction inspection um, reports on a monthly basis, where they're visiting the site uh, or during critical um, aspects of a job, and they're they're visiting the site, providing reporting to ISD, um, and all the third party testing is also provided to ISD. So I don't foresee, um, need, you know, ever the, the town ever having to step in to to uh, perform any of that, those services. Okay, so we're um, bound by. We're bound by controlled construction in Massachusetts. Correct. We have to be yep. we have to be looked at by our architects and our engineers, and we have to report to the town. Correct. Um, and the, the question on, on snow removal, um, obviously, you're going to shovel the sidewalks as well. Um, but I think the question is just that you know that where. We Will that snow end up being um, to make sure there's no sight line issues? Um, you know, if heavy snow is going to be piled up against the sides of the of the driveway in such a way that it interferes with the you know the ability of vehicles to to see up and down the the street while they're trying to exit, that may be something that the you know the applicant would want to reconsider that location, that snow, and that placement. And sort of the second part of that too is that if if the, the locations that the applicant has chosen to store their snow, if it's an exceptional snow year. Um, and that the snow is unable to be accommodated, that it has to be moved off of site, that you're not allowed to then encroach on the street or into other places. So it, it serves other purposes. And so, it's, you know, we'll obviously take a look at that. Yeah, but I think, oh, go ahead, Matt. Mr. Chairman, just um, actually, because I never even thought to ask this question, and it's different in every community, does, um, so the town does not um, remove snow from the right of way. That's the responsibility of the owner along their own frontage. So the owner is responsible for clearing the sidewalk, but not the street. That's that's what I was asking about the sidewalk. Yep. So we okay, we, yep. we, own, we own we own the sidewalk. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and your point's well taken about obstructing sight distance and things like that. I mean, we appreciate that. So again, it it was just the way the condition was drafted. It felt like it would it may have come from a project that where you know the 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 developer is really building driveways and you know it's a, a, a different project it's mm -hmm. just not uh um um we, we don't have that here certainly if there's a condition that says snow management will be undertaken in a way so as not to interfere with uh, uh sight line distance views and things like that we want to put in a condition that says that but yeah that's not that that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense i mean it would be it would we would have a condition like that, and the condominium association would would actually do that anyway. You you, you know, mm -hmm. have to pull out of the driveway and not be able to see where you're going. You mm -hmm. have to put that snow somewhere else. Right. Um, we can take another read at the, the information about condo docs and the property management plan. I think um, there are certainly things that the the board is looking for, that the town is looking for, especially things that are in support of. Um, you know, the goals of mass housing and the, the public housing uh, requirements, we want to make sure that those kinds of things are in there and are, um, are enforceable. So I think that that's more where that's coming from rather than sort of the nitty gritty of how the, the board operates. Itself. Right. I think you'll, um, my modified language may not be objectionable to you guys. You'll see it. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Hanlon. Um, on the condo documents, I think... Mr. Feldman has a point that that we ought to be clear on what it is we in, we're looking at those documents for because once you get into them, it's it, it's so much fun that you can <laughs> take hours and days to get out again. Um, but I think that it's important. But that this also gives us an opportunity to think through with something that when I was reading the decision, I felt a little ambivalent about. We used the word applicant over and over. 
uh, but the applicant isn't actually defined. There is something that defines what the permit holder is. Um, and I wasn't completely sure whether applicant was being used implicitly that somehow the applicant becomes the condo association, which it, which succeeds to all the obligations that the applicant has or whether uh, something else is, is in mind. Uh, this also comes up in connection with things like the, the management. Uh, you really, once, once this thing is built and control over the residential part has been ceded to a condo association, we need, I think, to be a little clearer than I feel that we are as to who has what obligations to whom. Um, and particularly under some circumstances, we want to we may want to be quite clear that the obligation this is an obligation to the town. It's it's not it's not automatically true that because you put something in a condo document that that creates an obligation between the condo association and the government of the town. So I think that that's just one of those things that that we need to imagine ourselves out a little bit further into the future and make sure that we clearly understand who has an obligation to whom to do what, and then try to make these and then try to make the conditions correspond with that and review of the condo documents can be a piece of that overall that overall process of creating a legal structure that everybody is going to be living with going forward. Yes, my, my experience on that exact subtopic is that the decisions is going to be recorded at the registry of deeds what we do in our condominium documents is we specifically reference that the uh, condominiums operations are subject to and need to be in compliance with the decision and so um what, what we do what happens is if if there is a condition that's not being filed it's it's going to run with the land and it is going to be uh, the responsibility of the condo association. So, so if the municipality sends an enforcement letter, it will send an enforcement letter to the Cond condominium association, and there will be a direct line. There will be a direct linkage, so that that enforcement letter has to be responded to, or it, it the condominium association will be subject to penalties and further action by the municipality, just like any other property owner. So. Um, uh, a lot of times the word applicant, um, I think, is used appropriately. The couple of times when we thought there was one time where we thought, uh, particularly when it comes to maintenance of the um, uh, stormwater management system, that there was a condition that said, look, if there's a repair that needs to happen and the condo association doesn't do it, the town wants the <laughs> right to do it. And then... Um, um, the kind of the kind of minimum social would be obligated to reimburse the town. Um, I did switch that language around to make that legal connection uh, work correctly, given the timing. Um, but um, I, I think the, the board can have a lot of confidence that once this decision is recorded and and it's recorded and our condominium documents specifically say that the operations of the condominium are subject to compliance with the decision that there is an enforcement mechanism available to the to the uh, the town uh, if there's if the if the conditions are ever violated, just like for any other property owner. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont. So just following up on what Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Feldman were just discussing, as I was reading this uh, provision in the conditions, I was wondering if rather than, in addition, I guess, to saying that, you know, the decision has been recorded at the Registry of Deeds and that the Condominium Association is going to be, um, the operation is going to be subject to the conditions contained in the decision, I'm wondering if it would ever make sense and if it would not be too onerous to have some sort of a digest appended to the condominium documents referencing the sections specifically that are carrying over from the applicant into the condominium trust. 
So it, it was just a thought because I know that, you know, if you have the manager or people who are administering the condominium business on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't know how they reach those conditions that they have to actually comply with. So I just thought a list somehow of those incorporated into the condo trust, for instance, uh, by way of reference might not be a bad idea. Uh, that's that's not objectionable at all. Uh, it's frankly, when, if my office prepares the condominium documents, um, and I've and I've done this on many occasions, we actually do that. We we put in the condominium documents sort of the specific um, continuing, you know, conditions that um, we we we. We, we point them out in the condominium documents so you don't have to go back to the decision to find them. So that's just our practice in our office. Um, I haven't talked to the client about hiring us to do the condominium documents to it yet, but um, uh, you know, we're not the cheapest office in town for doing condo documents. So I, I fully respect that they go somewhere else, but um, that that is our practice. So it's not, it's not a big deal to do. Thank you. Great. Are there other questions from the board in regards to the proposed conditions as put forward by the applicant? So tomorrow I'm going to submit a red line to Mr. Haverty um, and, and I'll okay. leave it up to Mr. Haverty how he wants to digest it and disseminate it to the board. I mean, I got the draft from him uh, and maybe I got it from you, Christian. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually send it to whomever wants the red line. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. Just let me know. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it's worthwhile for me to go through some of the ones that I have um, identified. Um, we can do it sort of in the same format. Um, uh, so I had a couple comments on the procedural history. I know um, Paul, you had mentioned there were some places where they're specifically looking for numbers, like the lot coverage and the we're, we're consistent out, we're coverage and, and things like that. Yep, that you guys will grab. That's great. Um, just want to confirm with you the ground level commercial space. I believe it's sixteen fifty eight square feet is what it was on the last plan. So it, yeah, I put in approximately seventeen hundred in every place where I saw the nine thirty five. Okay. Because I know that change when we created the basement area and Mr. Haverty wouldn't have picked that up. He wouldn't have realized there was a change in the design there. Yeah. Um, jurisdictional findings are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to talk to the, I have to talk to the planning department to get the, um, the subsidized housing inventory number um, for that. So I'll take care of that. Yeah, but just um, uh, factual just, findings. Just, just on that sort of the latest yep. uh, publication from DHCD is that December 20th, 2020. That is okay. the latest publicly available where Arlington is at 5.7%. Uh, 5.7? That was what I put in. Yeah, that's what's reported on okay. uh, that uh, DHCD inventory. And that's what I, I filled in for that. And that okay. is that I did confirm that's the we just one available, Paul. I don't know if you know of another. Well, uh, what I do know is that since December 2020, the town has approved a couple of um, comprehensive permit developments. So the, the number most likely has changed, but I am aware, um, you know, that DHCD hadn't updated the, the SHI since then. But you did reference the date of the HSI, so when it gets, right. it'll get fixed. I mean, it, it right, it, and and you can request specific, you know, more up to date SHI for a town from DHCD, but they they don't. They I mean they're they're pretty slow to update. You know, the overall SHI, you know, for the entire state. Um, in particular, they've been waiting for the census information to come. So that I think that they didn't want to bother doing an iteration before that that data was ready. Um, so if, if we have the more accurate local 
SHI information, it would be helpful to include it. If not, we just rely on the December 20th. Certainly not going to add 4.3%. No. <laughs> okay. Um, the factual findings are just filling in a couple of um, little things here and there. Um, uh, I'm assuming, Paul, you have the proposed square footage of work within the aura. I think you guys are, will be able to provide that. Um, <clears throat> So change that all access to the project is from Mass Ave. There is no other side available. Um, project is set. I counted 75 parking spaces. I know that number is sometimes 75, sometimes 76, but I think 75 is the correct number um, for, with eight for, short term spaces on the exterior. You're talking about bike racks. Yes. Yeah. So I have 75 too, but I have 49 okay. and 26. And you said there were 48. So that means it must be 27. 48 and 27. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. We'll double check. Okay. Um, uh, so there was a, there's a, a note in here. Um, how much of the site is currently covered by impervious surface? Uh, what the total of the impervious surface will be afterwards and whether because the question is whether it's going to be a reduction in impervious surface or an addition in impervious surface. Um, so once you provide those numbers, obviously we'll know which way that's going. Excuse me, Mr. Um, Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Could just, I've, I've been doing fine in following so far, but I'll get lost soon. And if, if you all could- Would you like me to share? Well, I I don't really care that. I, you can if you want. I'm I'm actually would, you, would be satisfied with the lesser course of just identifying what paragraph you're talking about. Okay, certainly. But that's because um, I have it on my screen, so I'm following along. Ah, perfect. Okay. So the next section is the conditions section. Um, there's a, a section A2 is the list of the drawings. So I've gone ahead, um, added documentation, um, added the landscaping plans, added the lighting plans, uh, the construction management plan. So all of those are included. Um, so we'll just confirm that those are all correct. Um, we need to infill the number of bedrooms, but Paul, I'm assuming you I, have, have that. that. I've done that already. No, okay. Um, then um, schedule all the way down to where am I? The submission requirements. Um, there was a there's a line in here about prototype screening plans for dumpsters. Picking plantings and fencing. Obviously, we don't need that because all the trash storage will be inside the building. Um, then there's a note. There, there, I think there's a couple different places in here where we talk about plant maintenance, um, and we just want to make sure that we get all those co sort of coordinated. Um, there's one here that talks about 12 months after completion of plantings, the applicant to remove and replace any dead disease plantings or trees. Um, on prior, prior projects, we've done it as a three-year thing, and I know we had discussed last time it being a 10-year thing, so I think we just need to figure out what the what the right, right. one of those is and sort of coordinate well, on those. We talked about this with the CONCOM. For the Millbrook property, there's a two-year period because that's our rights of access we, that we were able to negotiate was for two okay. years. Um, but, but that was the off-site enhancement. For the on-site, um, we we have a 10 year annual um, uh, monitoring obligation and and you'll you'll see our proposed language. It's pretty comprehensive. Okay. Perfect. Um, Paul, Mr. Chairman, if I may, no, Matt, Paul, do we want to discuss what the Conservation Commission uh, mentioned um, with regard to bonds, so we can just get that out. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, I I didn't know if the chair was going to be here. Um, you know, under the State Wetlands Protection Act, there's no ability to uh, require the applicant to have a bond. Um, mm -hmm. But under the under your local bylaw, there is a provision that um, um, would allow the town to have a bond. Well, there are, there's actually I went back and I looked at the local regs and the way the local regs are 
drafted. They're they're drafted to say that, you know, to secure that the work is going to be done, you could do a bond or you can, uh, or the Conservation Commission can can restrict, you know, conveyance of the uh, of the property until the, the work has been installed. Um, there was discussion at the at the CONCOM about somehow having a bond out there for the next 10 years to 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 make sure that the condominium association was was going to do what it's supposed to do under its annual uh, monitoring and and um we 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 did spend a few minutes at the public hearing indicating that 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 would be a real problematic provision because the condominium associations they don't they don't have a capacity to post bonds and how they would post bonds. And I'm not sure what the municipality would do with that bond. They would they enter on the condo property and they're going to end up doing work on the condo property using, using the bond. It, it, um, it, 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 it didn't seem to fit um, in this circumstance. It would really be a complication. So the, the CONCOM was quick to say, Look, if we don't have bonding authority under the Wetlands Protection Act, so this is something that we're going to address with ZBA. But since since they're not here, but Matt brought it up, we want to alert you to the fact yep. that they they seem to be interested in in or talking about a bond. But um, there's there there I think much more effective enforcement capabilities for the municipality that are more straightforward and, and easier to administer than trying to impose a bond on a condominium association. Um, because again, it's just what Mr. Hanlon said. There's a time when the applicant sells out the units and then the project's owned and operated by a condominium association. And that's going to be for most of the period of the 10 year um, annual obligation on uh on monitoring, for example, and and having a bond requirement for that is 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 very challenging. Um, the, there's a certificate of compliance which we're going to have to obtain when the work is complete. So that that's a very important enforcement tool. The Conservation Commission isn't going to issue a certificate of compliance, yeah. uh, frankly, nor will the ZBA until we demonstrated that we constructed the work in accordance with the order of conditions and the plan. So there, there are so many enforcement mechanisms that are available that um, we really uh, objected to the notion of a bond in this circumstance. But the chair of the CONCOM isn't here. Um, so I, again, in the same spirit that Mr. Hamlin brought up when we talked about the historic commission, you know, he's only hearing one side. I, 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 I just, um, just want you to know where we were, where we, where we were coming from on that subject. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things in here about sewer permits and such. We just clarify that the applicant is not responsible for inflow and infiltration fees. Uh, I, I had, I made the same clarification. <laughs> um, the property management plan um, just added vegetation management to the list of things that's in that list. Um, on the uh, construction management plan, um, as with additional notes about coordination with the town uh, to provide additional information for the for upcoming activities. Um, there was one requirement that, that we deleted on that subject. There, there was a requirement that the applicant hold a public meeting with just any members of the public to present this plan. We 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 don't think that's that's appropriate at all. I mean, that that that, that mm -hmm. it, it has been more appropriate for some other recent projects that were much deeper in residential neighborhoods. Um, okay, Fair but in this so you circumstance. Right. That, that may be reasonable to um to not necessarily require that yeah so you'll see in our, in our draft i deleted it and substituted the construction management plan exhibit okay um 
there was a line in here about the applicant should use electric heat and hot water for the project. Uh, um, and just added, we I just added that a natural gas service is to be provided for the backup generator uh, for the elevator as required under state law. Um, that we're aware that that's coming in. Um, Mr. So, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I just, I just have to be clear about that. If you read those two things together, it comes to the conclusion that appliances will be all electric too. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that. And if that's not what's intended, that the applicant should should say so. But this would involve dryers and cooking and stoves and all kinds of things like that, which would could rely on gas and that would be go beyond the generator. Mr. Hanlon, we we are we appreciate that. We are aware and we would intend for the cooking and the uh, laundry to also be electric. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, section Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I'd like to actually say that again because otherwise, I mean, if that's what the intent is, I don't want to leave it in a situation where you have two two sentences that are looking that appear to be looking in different directions. It would be useful just to have it clear on its face what's okay. required. Perhaps it's just that this will be an all electric building, with the exception of a gas service for a backup generator for elevators. Right. Okay. That's deeply appreciated, incidentally. Yep. Thank you. We can, we can massage that. Um, <clears throat> the E13 was the one about the construction hours. So it is Title V, Article 12 is where the those hours are. Um, uh, again, about just the location of the, the trash. I don't think you're having dumpsters at all, correct? Is it just trash, trash barrels and recycling barrels? Correct. Okay. Um, then it's to, towards the end of the E series. There, so the E's, the E section is specifically about project design and construction. Um, there are a bunch that we have had on similar projects that um, we're sort of considering. Um, we had talked, I think we had talked about doing a um, a survey of a of abutting properties just in terms of uh, making sure there's no settlement. Uh, we were especially concerned about the house immediately to the east where they're very, very close to the corner of the property. So just including some some language about conducting that survey and monitoring uh, for that. Um, wanted to put in there that you have submitted a truck path diagram to the board showing the path for construction vehicles accessing the site um, and that truck access to the site and egress from the site shall only be from the westbound lane of Massachusetts Avenue. So just want to make sure we had included that as well. Um, we have uh, adding, a adding a statement about the applicant shall hire a licensed pet control company to conduct a comprehensive assessment of pest activity on the property and develop and implement an integrated pest management plan. Um, so obviously, if there's no pests detected, then that's not an issue. If there are pests, we just want to make sure that that's addressed um, going forward. Um, there, in the drawings, there's a shaft. There's an open shaft adjacent to the elevators. I wasn't sure if there was space in that, possibly for if the retail space on the first floor wanted to be used as a restaurant, would they be able to utilize that shaft for ventilation? Um, no. Well, the, the issue with once you get into any sort of um, restaurant construction, then you're looking at a gas service mm -hmm. for uh, for cooking and for uh, heated yeah. makeup air and things of that nature. So um, in our minds, with an all electric building, uh, we're going to be li limited to other retail uses other than uh, restaurant food services. Ah, OK. Um. And then there was a comment that the um, uh, redevelopment board had put forward earlier on um, about access to the bike storage area in the basement. Um, so just noting that the interior dimensions of at least one elevator should accommodate a standard bicycle uh, with we, both we wheels on the ground. We, we, okay, one, of our, one of our and solutions then, demonstrated that it's sized for a bicycle. We've really perfect. Okay. Um, 
there's uh, the parking spaces. So um, are there 50 or 51 parking spaces? 51. 51, okay. Um, there's we 10 50, compact 52. size and two accessible. We had 52 and then when we um, install, uh, we proposed the um, the doors out to the uh, woodland area um, that took away one of the parking spaces, which netted us 51. Okay. Mr. Chen. The, um, for the, Mr. Hanlon. On <clears throat> condition F8, which I think is what we were yep. just talking about. Um, the it previously it said 5%. Now it says 11, which is kind of more than 5%. And I'm just wondering what's intended there. So 11 is just the count that's shown on the drawing today. I see. Okay. Um, well, that I, I, what I'm wondering, I, I, I just happened to have been amusing myself by reading through the uh, new stretch code. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff about, about, uh, uh, being EV ready, uh, and you're here. You're actually just providing the spaces themselves. I believe it's like twenty percent EV re ready yep. uh, here. Um, and by the time I'm guessing, by the time the applicant succeeds in getting a building permit, the stretch code, if not the specialized code, will be applicable here. The I think the the effective date is July first, um, and I guess. I wouldn't want to go into saying all of the things that you need to have to be uh, to be EV ready, but a generic reminder that uh, the applicant will be complying with the requirements of the building code on on providing parking might might be helpful. I'm especially concerned about the second sentence here about just providing for expansion of the number of charging stations in accordance with tenant demand, uh, because at least as I read the the updated code. Uh, more things will have to be uh, EV ready uh, than that, and uh, so, and and it's not clear to me exactly what the capability is of the EV stations that are going to be there. So, I don't think that this is a big issue, but I would like to be sort of have more clarity about what what exactly is in, is intended here. You mean in terms of the electric? The, yeah, the, I um, think that it's already at twenty percent, right? Twenty percent of fifty is roughly is ten. Yeah. Um, so it's already being provided for, um, and I'm just I'm, I'm just interested in knowing you know what the capability of that of that is, and whether it would be equivalent to what the uh, state would consider EV ready if the charging station had hadn't already been built. No idea. Well, what, let me let me let me speak to the stretch code. Mr. Haberty and I have had conversations about this. Um, you know, the, whether or not it the the stretch code is going to be applicable to this project is not. It, it's not a. Um, it's a state code issue, so it's not. Um, you know, uh, a, a local issue. Either we have to comply with it, or if we don't, and. Um, and the uh, it, there's a real question of of if um, we would have to comply with something that we've already in the process of applying for. So it may not be applicable to us, but that's it's not a decision that that is um, uh, made by the ZBA. It's a state law uh, issue at the end of the day. Um, and Matt, do you know uh, to, from Chris what what the EV ready um, capability is going to be? Is are they going to be fast chargers? Are they going to be? Do you know, do you know what you're what you're planning for the for those charging stations? Uh, we haven't gotten into the those weeds yet, Paul. Um, we have to size the electrical service based on uh, something. So, um, you know that'll come obviously you know during design development. Um, there's a there's a, a slew of different um, methods to to achieve it. There's the fast charging ones, which you know really re require like a 60 amp dedicated circuit. Um, there's other uh, systems where they have priority um, charging, where um, you know three or four, five cars you know share um, you know one circuit. 
Um, and we can really dial in. And I, I agree with Mr. Hanlon. Um, it, it definitely begs a deeper dive into what EV ready is and what we want to do to be prepared um, if we would fall under this that stretch code. Uh, Mr. Chair? Ms. Hoffman. Um, I, my understanding, not that this is uh, necessary for the hearing, um, but is that if you're to be EV ready, you're supposed to be providing conduit to the spaces. And the only reason I bring that up is because I thought maybe it had come up um, in previous hearings that there you were planning to bring um, conduit um, to more of the spaces. Is, is that accurate or not? Because if it is part of the plan, maybe that could be reflected here. Um, we, we did have conversations about providing an empty conduit um, to, to each parking space. However, that gets tricky when you have parking spaces that don't have uh, a, you know, a wall space or you know adjacent to it or in front of it. Um, so um, I think we, I have to go back to my notes, but I believe we uh, backed down from that and we just you know provided the approximate 20% um, that we needed. Um, and um, we, we, should should check, we should check with Chris on that, uh, Mel, yeah. because I think he, I thought that Chris um, has provided for conduit on that. We should check. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hanlon. Um, if I could be brave enough to venture to F9, I, I just was wondering whether... So they don't know what F9 uh, is because I added it. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, is parking for units shall be subject to an additional monthly fee at market rate separate from the regular condominium fees? Permit holders shall be issued, a, well, it says issues, but it should be issued a sticker tag to be displayed on their vehicle. I, I, the underlying principle behind that, I, I assume, is that if you didn't want to have a parking space, you could make that parking space available to somebody else and they could buy it for and and you go free. It's a sort of thing that that is kind of more common in non-ownership situations. Uh, and I just want to be, be I mean the idea here is to basically allow people to save money by not by not having a car or and I'm wondering if that's if if that's clearly enough understood. And if the applicant has a problem with that, yeah, I, I, well, yeah it's, we didn't have any. I was gonna say we didn't have any direction as to how spaces were gonna be allocated if they're gonna be deeded with the unit, if they're gonna be sold separately, how that's gonna happen. So I just wanted to. This is a starting point for some language along that line. The intention would be that they be, uh, you know, there's a parking space deeded to each unit for the price. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't want to have we wouldn't want to have a condition that went into the economics of how the parking spaces are 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 th that they're decoupled from the units or something like that. That you know that 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 is a bigger issue in rental projects, but not mm -hmm. in a for sale condominium okay. development. All right, and then obviously the condo board will have to figure out like who gets to have an electric space and who gets to have an accessible space and those kinds of issues. Um, and then we had talked about um, improving one of the existing crosswalks on Mass Ave. That was something that had come up a few times. Um, and I believe it's the one that's in front of 990 Massachusetts Avenue. Right. So I, I thought propose that the applicant I thought that was picked up by the uh, in the project plans. There, there was a submission by Vaness that shows mm -hmm. that crosswalk and the improvements, the the restriping of it. Um, so I thought that was already picked up through the reference to the drawings of the project. If if not, that's maybe the simplest way to address that. There is a there is a uh, from Vaness. There's the the restriping. Okay. Of that. Well, there's there's two. Well, we are we're the CMP has the temporary crosswalk that, that describes exactly what we're doing, but then there is a, there's an additional permanent crosswalk that we've agreed to upgrade. And I don't remember if that both of those. Uh, yeah, agreed. it is. It, I think I think it. I think that permanent upgrade it was one of the things that was in Vanessa's thing. 
But if not, we could put it into words. But I, I think okay. I think it's shown on a on a Vanessa exhibit. I'll go back and check. But we're pleased we're pleased to add the language in. It makes it would make sense. It'll just you know keep us um, in tune that we have to do it. Okay. Um, and then it, you had said again that you're not planning on providing lift assistance for the bike storage areas on the main level. Um, uh, in the garage, right? Correct. But you are providing a bike maintenance stand for residents on the lower level. Correct. Um, okay, so I just want to include that. Um, then the next section is police fire emergency. Um, so the, all elevators must have emergency generator backup as that's added as required by Mass State Elevator Code. Um, during construction, the project shall have a superintendent on site during working hours to address security and traffic concerns with the police department. Um, obviously, you'll have a construction. There will be a construction superintendent on site during working hours. Um, so this is just and that's uh, that's actually that's actually um, in in the building code. So that's a law. Yep. Okay. Um, section H is water, sewer, and utilities. Um, just clarifying that the applicant is responsible for all trash recycling and yard waste removal. Um, and then you had noted the fire hydrants on the property shall remain private, that those don't exist. So we'll go ahead and strike that. Yeah, there's another um, paragraph in H4. Then, there's another sentence in H4 that I'm striking where it says the applicant shall replace this, the water main hydrants and gate valves. We're not we're tapping into the existing high pressure water main. We're not replacing any water mains. It's just again, it's the it's it's carryover for a different project where they're actually installing water mains. We're not installing okay. water mains here. So I, we you'll see a deletion of that sentence in my draft. All righty. Um, and then I say utility meters where required to be mounted externally are to be located on the sides of the building. Do not mount utility meters, meters or other structures on the front of the building. Um, I'm assuming that if it's all electrical, they're all going to be interior anyways, but right. just that if you are required to have a meter, don't put it on the front. Um, and then on, in the next section of wetlands was that I had the applicant should provide a bond amount in the <laughs> bond in the amount of blank. So uh, we will discuss that with conservation and um, see how they want to make sure that uh, the intent of the the intent of the bond is carried through. Um, and then we have a section which we didn't include initially, we have had on other projects. Um, it says, while no dewatering is anticipated by the applicant, any water discharge as part of any dewatering operation shall be passed through filters on site, yada, yada, yada. So it's just a, it's a catch all in case you run into water, but we don't anticipate you will, but you are close to the river, so we're not entirely sure. Um, and then um, uh, we have going down to uh, what I-14, all mitigation plantings shall be maintained according to the standards of the American Association of Nurserymen. Uh, we have a catch-all after that in the event that the AAN ceases to exist or issue to maintain relevant standards. Um, it's just, just in case they were relying on the American Association of Nurserymen and they cease to exist, that we still have uh, what we need. Um, and I had added fencing surrounding the urban forest in the rear yard shall have sufficient clearance below the bottom rail to allow small animals to migrate to and between adjacent resource areas. Yeah, um, when, you, when you the, the when you look at when you look at our revised plans, you're going to see the gap in the in the plans. It, it, okay, that gap is shown on the drawings. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, this is when we had a discussion last time and Ms. Hoffman uh, raised the question about what the material of the fencing would be. Uh, and uh, and in, we were offered a choice by the applicant as to whether to have cedar or I don't remember what the other option was, well, but everybody, well, it was a vinyl. Uh, but Ms. Hoffman and the rest of us all shook our heads and said cedar is definitely the way to go. So that's all not, not to forget that. that. Thank you. That, that's specified on the plans that we submitted today. Great. It's 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 clearly labeled as a cedar 
Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and I was concerned sort of the rear part of the, lo of the lot is sort of this enclosed area um, where we have a lot of plantings that are gonna take time to establish themselves and to grow and to really sort of thrive. Um, I wasn't sure if there should be some kind of a policy in regards to pets about sort of not using the rear area as a run yard for animals because I could unfortunately see someone someone's over exuberant dog sort of tearing up some of these plantings that you're working so hard to establish. Um, so I don't know what, you know, that's obviously it's up to the condo association, but that's just something that, uh, you know, they may want to consider because it could cause a lot of damage very quickly. Um, and then we had discussed that the impervious pavement at the, at the patio area, the front of the building is to be pitched as best as practical to direct surface water towards the landscaped areas instead of towards the street. Yeah, um, that's, we yes, discussed yeah, this, it may not be practical. But yeah. it's, it's, it's been designed that way on the, on the, on the revised civil drawings. Oh, perfect. The they, they, that's been taken into Great. account in the drawings. Okay. Um, and then I had added something about street trees on the, um, additional street trees in addition to the ones that you had already included. You've indicated that that's something you're not intending to do. Um, we said section J, other general conditions. Um, a line here, overnight parking of vehicles on public ways is prohibited in the town of Arlington. Um, this true, A, there's a, there's a, there is a, um, there is a way to get a, a grant from the town, from the police department for up to 14 nights per year. But the town is also now talking about possibly doing a, an overnight parking um, pilot study, which would allow parking on street. So I'm not quite sure how, <laughs> what we should do about that language. Um, but I did want to include there that the parking of vehicles on private ways without the permission of the property owner is likewise prohibited, um, which well, you had included I, as we had asked I, on the CMP. See, I don't, I, I mean, the particular condition you're talking about with parking, I didn't see in here. So it must be something that you're adding, Mr. Klein. Um, but if it, it, it is, I think the way it should be J4. phrased. Is, I'm sorry? It's J4. Oh, unregistered vehicles. Right. We, we can't yep. have unregistered but, but then the next line is that overnight parking of vehicles. Right, so it's, I would just say overnight parking of vehicles on public ways is prohibited. You could just say currently, or that the 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 overnight parking shall comply with the regulations of the town of Arlington, and if they okay. change, they change. Whatever they are, they are. All right. All right. I'll make a note of that too. And then we got down into the waivers. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, waiver number five, which is the one about parking. Um, so I had just revised the bylaw and now it's one parking space per residential unit. Um, but then there's also parking required for the retail space. So Eventually, so essentially what I note is that a, um, the applicant requests a waiver to allow a total of 50 spaces for the proposed 50 condominium units, but it's actually 51 spaces. And it's 1,700 square feet of commercial. Yeah. Approximately. Okay. okay. Um, so the waiver, the waiver would still be required. Right. Um, because it, it, it's dead, but it's only like 54 down to 51, I think. Um, and then just the next one, um, the bicycle parking design guidelines, I just changed the zoning bylaw, Article 6, Section 6, 1, 12, which is the, the zoning side of that, um, and about the number of required parking spaces uh, for bicycles. So um, I'll need to finish massaging that about the number of units in basement, number if units hang, hanging um, and then the board action will need to determine. Uh, I think seven, eight, nine, those were 10. Those are all pretty 
straightforward number 10 just waiting on the report from the historic commission uh but as you as you stated um i think we're you know we're, we're fine just reporting on that um on outdoor lighting are you still requesting a waiver for up lighting because the, no. the drawing set the, no we we took no. that we we took that out of the uh the, the way to scrape a list paul, paul may have been looking at the original oh, okay. list when he prepared this all right so we'll strike that one um and then the sewer inflow infiltration fees we already said that we're not doing that um and then the arb had noted that um there's one waiver you were missing um which is article 5 section 5 3 17 which is the the building step back that for buildings over three stories high, there's a seven and a half foot step back requiring at the fourth story. Um, so we just want to make sure that you're requesting that waiver because it will be required. Okay, so we will. Okay, so there are two now. One is the um, the noise for the construction time, and the yep. other is the fourth floor mm -hmm. setback of seven and a half feet, which we're asking to be waived. Um. Mr. Chairman, one point right. of and that second one is in the zoning bylaws. And it, it just I just want to give you the citation. It's 5317, just so you have that for your notes. Yes, Matt. Um, one point of clarification on the on the site lighting. So um, I believe, and I'd have to go back to um, our response letter from um, Harrison Mulhern Architects, but um, the, the lighting that was proposed is not actually up lighting, it's um, accent lighting that would um, basically provide illumination of the um, of the towers, uh, mm -hmm. the towers on the building, and I believe Chris explained that it, you know, wasn't by definition didn't fall into the category of uplighting. Um, so I believe that lighting is still in the photometrics. I, I have to I have to check that in the morning, but I believe it's still in the photometrics. Okay, yeah, if you could let us know, because I, I would I need to go back and take a look at Article Fourteen as well in the town bylaw to see exactly what it says. Um, if, it's yeah, an issue, if, it's, if it's an issue, if it's an issue, we'll take it out. I, I just, um, I think we were able to redefine what it is, and I, I thought the issue mm -hmm. uh, if that resolved the issue. But if not, we can we can certainly take it out. Okay. All right. Those were all, all my, my comments. Um. Those are so that. And I had basically gone through that entire list, Paul, that you and I had gone through before um, of places. I thought that there may be um, some different places where we were looking for some different conditions and try to place something on all of those. So um, I'll go ahead and revise this as well. And then I can forward this off uh, to both Pauls tomorrow. And um, or I should say two of the three Pauls. And then we'll. Uh, We'll let Mr. Haverty deal with the hard question of how to piece this together. Yes, Lee. so I, I need to get some of the blanks on the numbers. I need to get from our civil engineer. I asked him for it, but I haven't. Mike, um, Mike Novak hasn't responded. So I'm going to wait to send my red line to Paul until I can get those blanks filled in for him too. Okay. Those square footages. But if it's not tomorrow, it'll be Wednesday. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so at this stage, are there other questions specifically from the board? Seeing none, um, we do have a few members of the of the public in attendance, and so I think it's important to go ahead and give them an opportunity to participate. Um, So for those of you who would, who would like to, so I'm going to go in a minute, I'll be opening the meeting for a public comment. Public comments take as it relates to the matters at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of helping us inform our decision. Uh, if you are participating uh, via the Zoom application, you may raise your hand using the button on the participants tab. And if you're calling in, you may dial star nine to indicate you would like to uh, be addressed. Uh, when you're called upon, please name an address for the record and then um, Give us a testimony you would like to to provide to the board. And when all public testimony is taken, the board will close the public comment period. So, with that, um, first hand up is uh, Patricia Warden.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Patricia Warden, 27 Jason Street. Uh, can you hear me? I certainly can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to um, ask the Zoning Board of Appeals to do everything in their power to prevent this destructive 40B project. The Conservation Commission presumably will be addressing the wetland issues, but overarching all of this is the um, sustainability considerations, um, which have attracted a great deal of attention in town and many town meeting votes as regards um, as regards our climate and sustainable concepts of construction. Um, this uh, th this um, project um, uh, does not have passive house type um, construction constraints. It is um, antithetical to heating systems like geothermal, um, which would be very important in, in a construction project of this size. Um, and this is a paradigm for exploitation and speculation in Arlington derived from the consideration of developer profits. Um, and the uh, housing considerations here too, the, the select board should never have um, allowed this project to be before the, the ZBA. It is an, in, actually in violation of the directives of the master plan for we are advised to have only new construction of affordable units. There are some um, marginally affordable units here, but the predominance is by far market rate or even luxury units, um, which the town does not need, they're using up resources the town does not have to spend on this kind of thing. And the huge amount of, um, of support, financial support would be needed for schools and infrastructure and things like that. It, I, I would particularly like to point out the fact that um, the fact that there is a house, an historic house that will be demolished should not be glossed over as is being done, as is, is of no importance. This section of Massachusetts Avenue is actually part of the Battle Road and will be completely despoiled by this project. And the loss of those two houses, especially the um, historic one, is just unacceptable. Um, we need those houses for other for other programs in town, the, the, the exemplary housing authority program for disabled adults. They should never be destroyed. This is ridiculous. And uh, I would like to say that um, I would really like to see the 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 the, the actual um, lies that were said of having no um, historic property on this site that uh, should have been addressed at the very beginning by denying this project. Um, and I do want to say that um, there are zero units of affordable housing for those who really need them in this project. That is antithetical to what the master plan directives say. So uh, once again, please use your your power your, to deny this project. I have much more to say about heat islands and cutting on trees and everything else, but this is a dreadful project and please do whatever you can to deny it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Are there other members of the public who wish to address the board this evening? Set of hands, Mr. Moore. Stephen Moore? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, uh, Piedmont Street. Uh, I am saddened to hear that the, um, the applicant is not willing to go along with the idea of additional um, street trees along in the neighborhood, making the contribution to the trees, please, fund. I understand uh, their logic. I, um, this particular area of town streetscape is uh, pretty desolate, and although the project is going to be contributing 
trees on its own property, we're trying to uh, remediate the fact that this is uh, the case here. And uh, I understand um, the consolation prize relative to um, to dealing with a sycamore tree is 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 certainly a nice idea. It's not um, not quite the same in that. Taking taking down a mature huge sycamore uh, in terms of its effect on global warming and such and mitigation is uh, is the problem, not so much what gets done with the wood that's left over after. Um, however, it's it still is a uh, a good idea, and I do applaud that they are going to do that. I would suggest perhaps um, getting in touch with the board of directors and Schwab Mill would be a good idea in terms of the use of that sycamore wood. They make, of course, historic, uh, you know, historic millennium picture frames and the like, and they may have use for the large lumber that would be created by that, uh, by the taking of that tree. Um, that said, I have a question on two issues in the draft decision. The first is, um, is C2J on page 14. Um, it talks about the applicant performing additional test pits stormwater basins. I'm wondering, is that to be done in the future or is the applicant is, uh, considering that that's completed at this point? Um, so we have- I would ask Mr. Manager to answer that. Yes, please. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the we've already um, completed the test pits to enable us to uh, design the stormwater infiltration system. So Paul and I have um, modified that language um, to remove that requirement in the future because that work is done. All right. So does that mean that, um, that the test pits uh, were sufficient and the drainage was sufficient and the test pits to deal with all that within the code, within the building code? Yes. Okay. So we can expect no additional runoff due to in porous surface or ledge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I raised an issue like that uh, relative to this before, and I just wanted to uh, sure that that problem is, is taken care of as far as is practical at this juncture. Uh, the second issue I have is I-16 on, um, I think it's page 24. Um, I'm going to go there myself because I'm, I think this had to do with... Um, going to it on my screen. Yes, I-16, it talks about the plantings, invasive species, removed projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you may have, I, there was some discussion about this earlier, I think. Um, in this case, it looks like this is something that was put in relative to the Conservation Commission comments. Uh, it talks about monitoring for three years with an annual report. I've also heard tonight about a 10-year plan and monitoring. I'm wondering which is the, which is the intended approach? And, and is this just the three year incorrect? Or is it somehow this is being different than what's being done under the 10 year uh, monitoring plan? Uh, Mr. Feldman? So um, when, let me read the proposed uh, monitoring report condition that, that nobody's seen yet so you can at least understand where we're where we're headed with this and then we could talk about mr moore's question and and reconcile any any issues anybody has uh, we're proposing a commission that says annual monitoring reports will be provided to the arlington zoning board and the conservation commission by november 15th of every year for a 10-year monitoring period after installation of the restored woodland by the way, that's a term that we use throughout, restored woodland instead of this urban park idea. It mm -hmm. seems, seems to be more descriptive. Um, these reports will describe the condition of the restored woodland, overview the management efforts undertaken over the past growing season, such as plant replacement, invasive species management, etc., and describe the anticipated management efforts required for the subsequent growing season. All reports shall include representative photographs of the restored woodland from photographic stations established within the woodland, such that year-to-year -year images can be compared. So I think what we're contemplating is that in the in the in the more typical 
three year monitoring period, you have this um, 80% survival rate um, that has to be achieved. We weren't suggesting that we move away from that. That, that was a specific requirement in the three year, but the, the annual reporting and, and what efforts are being made uh, in terms of uh, management of invasive species and plant replacements and what's anticipated as we see it develop, that's going to go on for another seven years after that. Um, so that's, I think the two are, one covers the first three year period and this was intended to cover from years four to 10. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Mr. Moore? Uh, that, that's, uh, that's good news. 10 years is certainly better than three and it sounds uh, very thorough. Um, I'm wondering, uh, once the uh, applicant builds a building and lets all the condos to the various folks, both affordable and non, uh, how does this survive? Is it, it is, I think there's been repeated mention of counter documents tonight. I, I still don't have much of a feel for how enforceable under document statements are, I mean, who do you go after? The condo board if they don't follow the rules? Um, so what happens after the applicant's done and the building is all leased? So uh, I, I think I can explain that. Legally, the land that is going to be the restored woodland is common area that is uh, the responsibility and the control of the condominium association. And so the condominium documents are gonna specifically provide that the condominium association's obligation to maintain the common area, the restored woodland is specifically a common area, and it's going to reference the obligation to provide uh, annual reports under a condition, what I put in is I-19, it was the next condition after I-18. Um, and so let's say uh, the condominium association um, or the management company fails to submit that report. I mean, it's gonna be in their annual budget that they have to do it, but they fail to submit it. Then um, there would be a, either a um, an enforcement notice either under the comprehensive permit or there's gonna be a similar obligation under the order of conditions under the state wetlands protection act that's a continuing obligation. And just like any other property owner that doesn't comply with the condition, the municipality is gonna be able to take an enforcement action and enforce compliance. Um, but it's, it's, it's the, the, the Woodland is actually going to be the, legal responsibility of the association to manage and maintain in accordance with the permits. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, it is defined common area. And, and so that's all specified in the condominium documents. So there is going to actually be that the trustees of the condominium association are, are responsible to perform the uh, obligations that are in here. And if they don't, and they get a letter from the municipality, um, uh, I, I, it would be uh, a violation of their fiduciary duty to ignore it. They, they just, they can't. Mr. Sure. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Chairman, I'd like just to add, the, if you were analyzing what the risk is that the reports aren't done or they're not done pro properly and the restored woodland area ultimately fails. There, there are two kinds of risks here. One is the risk that the condo association with the passage of time and people come and people go, uh, don't remember or don't understand what their obligation is. Uh, and the other is that on the town side, somebody has to be keeping track whether they actually get these reports or not and that's a particularly difficult problem because this isn't a common report. You know, if, if if everybody had to file it by November 15th, they'd they'd know whether they were getting a whole bunch of reports, but somebody has to be watching over this in the town side. So that's pretty much a town responsibility. You can't really ask Mr. Feldman's clients to to do that. And I must say that I am less 
then completely confident that the town will be up in the up to the task, not because of bad negligence or anything like that, but because it goes outside the standard procedures so that people don't watch it. Um, in the discussion we had earlier, though, I thought that the uh, the suggestion of Mr. Feldman that the obligations under the agreement be summarized and, you know, in a list that's fairly clear that people on the condo board understand that they're supposed to do this and why, uh, would go at least some distance towards avoiding having people just conveniently forget that they ever had an obligation to do this unless somebody prods and nobody ever prods. So I think that that's helpful. Uh, I would say this, that that in thinking about wh whoever does the condo documents, um, and I dearly hope that it's Mr. Feldman, but that's probably not within my my purview <laughs> to suggest. Um, but it seems to me that that the analysis that Mr. Feldman just gave as to why is their obligation to do that, and you have to kind of work all that out. In my experience, is not what you can usually expect from a condo board. If they've hired a man management association, that would help. Um, but I think some effort needs to be made to have a sort of a policy of clear statement about what the obligations are so that it doesn't require any great sophistication to understand them. Um, and I trust that the people who do the summary, if that's the way it happens with the condo documents, uh, would prepare it with 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 controlling that risk in mind. You know, I can make one more suggestion here. Uh, and that is that the applicant, which is who's before you, um, they're going to create the first annual budget for the association. And, you know, I, I think we could just add a line that says there will be a separate line item in the annual budget that uh, is for the annual reporting requirement. And it's, even if it's, in, and we're going to find out from our from our wetlands consultant roughly how much we have to carry because it's going to be the wetlands or the landscaping expert that's going to do the inspection that's going to do. So we're going to, and and so you know again once once a condo board has a budget in year one and it has a line item, you know annual reporting, um, they, they look at the. The next year they do the budget, they look at the prior year budget. They're gonna they're gonna see the line item. It's a practical way to create more confidence that um and so we'll we'll in the in the original budget we'll put a separate line item for this obligation. Um and it'll be it'll be in the budget that when the board takes over, they'll look at the prior year budget and they'll see it there. Um and one more thing if I may. Mr. Chairman, yes, that's, yes, that's a great call on Paul's on Paul's behalf. On uh, also, <clears throat> we have a commercial condo. Uh, we have a commercial space that uh, Majorities will re retain control of. Therefore, um, we will always have a seat on the board as long as we're um, the commercial owner of that of that space. So um, we're certainly um, well in tune with what the expectation is, and um, we'll always, as long as we own that space, we'll we'll be there to. Uh, support the board and and remind them um, of these conditions uh, and further um, you know this would be a project I think you know once it's landscaped once things are thriving it's going to be so beautiful that the association and the board of trustees are, are going to want to maintain this and make sure that it's in tip-top shape because it's it's an asset to the community you know the, to the condo community it's a it's a feature you know to for potential resale down the road and um in all of our experiences you know condo owners want to take care of their property so uh, those two pieces just to add is a, a little bit of confidence that you know we're going to be able to to keep the keep the pressure on that this place is going to you know be maintained properly great thanks mr chair any further mr moore um yeah i just want to say i appreciate uh, uh mr feldman's and mr Maggioli's comments uh relative to that that's uh that's good news um i uh and also uh mr hanlon for Hitting the nail on the head as he usually does. That's uh, exactly the issue that I have is how the, all this survives the conveyance of the property. I'm just trying to just trying to line out for for 
definite purposes, what's going on with the, uh, the you know, we're going to be basically flattening the current urban forest and building a new one. And I want to make sure that it has the top chance for survival. So thank you very much for all of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period for this evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Tora. To those who participated, um, there's a couple of uh, sort of votes the board needs to take the stage, sort of to close things out. But before we do that, are there any other questions or comments that the members of the board have for the applicant? Um, just if you know, this is a great time to get those questions out there in case we need to research anything. Because obviously, once once the public hearing is closed, we cannot we can no longer seek uh, you know answers to questions outside the board. So, um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to bring them forward at this time. Otherwise, um, we'll move on. Mr. Chair, Mr. LeBlanc. I uh, just wanted to address one of the comments from the public as well as something that was brought up earlier in this meeting, um, that the compliance with the state building codes is all based on the date of the issuance of the building permit, um, and that uh, Mr. Hanlon is correct, it is the July 1st of this year where the new uh, stretch energy code comes into effect for commercial buildings, uh, and then also the uh, specialized code that the town is voting on with the town meeting will take effect six months after approval, if it is so approved. Um, so, you know, just uh, refer to your architect on compliance with all of those things, depending on what the project schedule is. Thank you for that. You know, can, can I, uh, uh, you know, um, Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate, Mr. Mm -hmm. Harry and I have spoken about this issue and, 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 I'd like, I'd like to defer to him so he could articulate, he does it much better than I do, um, exactly how this will ultimately play out. Well, I, I don't know that we know exactly how this will ultimately play out. The question is whether or not the local adoption of uh, opt-in portion of the state building code constitutes a local rule or whether it's a state law. Ultimately, it's really not something that the Zoning Board of Appeals needs to make a determination. Because if it's state law, you don't have the authority to grant waivers. For it. If it is local rule, then it was adopted after the comprehensive permit application was filed, and it's thus not applicable to this development. I can't really give you a definitive answer as to which of those two options ultimately will be applicable because I haven't seen any sort of determinations. The closest I have come to seeing any sort of guidance on this question was back at the last, when they when they adopted the stretch code in I think 2008 or so, there was a project that went to the State Building Code Appeals Board, and, and rather than arguing that it was a local rule that was waivable under 40B, they requested a waiver from the State Building Code Appeals Board regarding a particular provision, arguing that it made the, the project essentially uneconomic. Um, this, and that was with support of the local board and the State Building Code Appeals Board agreed and granted the waiver. Um, so in that regard, the State Building Code Appeals Board, you know, certainly wasn't going to independently make a determination that it didn't have jurisdiction when the, the parties, you know, were asking it for relief. But if if you're reading those tea leaves, then maybe it, it does constitute state law. Um, but under Chapter 40B, there really there's nothing more decisive than that to give any sort of guidance. Yes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, I just I should add this question came up in a forum that. Uh, the town of Arlington had on the stretch code on on the specialized code in on March 1st and uh, a member of the ARB uh, raised that question with the 
deputy director of DOER, who was one of the people who drafted the code, they at least are convinced that it's a question of state law and that it would apply. And uh, now it's not DOER's responsibility to make that call either. So we, one has to make of it whatever whatever you can. Uh, but at least from the point of view of the agency that is responsible for devising the code, they think what they're doing is doing a matter of state law. And I think Mr. Haverty is quite correct that the specialized code is under is basically the same as the original stretch code in this regard because they're structured in pretty much the same way. So, Mr. Chairman, my only reason for bringing this up, and because I appreciated Mr. Le LeBlanc's comment, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't want to just rely on that comment because he sort of ended it with, so it's going to be required <laughs> Uh, for the stretch code is going to be required for this project, and that's how he ended it. And there's there's a there's a there's a there's a, le there's a real open legal question if that's the case or not. It's just not something that the ZBA can do something about. So that's the only reason why I appreciated Mr. LeBlanc's comment, but I wanted I didn't want him to have the misimpression that it's automatically going to be required if it's deemed state law and we don't have our building permit in. Um, uh, in time for it not to be applicable to, to this project, it's going to apply to this project. But if it's not, and it's local because it was a local adoption of the stretch code, then it's not going to be applicable to us because we already filed our 40B application. So I, that's the only reason why I put us through this explanation. I just didn't want, I didn't want there to be a misunderstanding on this subject. further questions okay <clears throat> so i had uh sent an email to uh Betsy Maggiore a little <clears throat> excuse me a little earlier this afternoon um so knowing that we're sort of coming to the end i had reached out to our consultants to ask uh where they were in terms of their finances um so the board has two consultants we have tetra tech and we have davis square architects who are assisting us in our review um one of them has is on track with their finances uh, per their initial request. Um, the other one has run over and is looking to um, for additional funds to complete their to both cover the work they've already done and to complete the work that um, would be required to review the final uh, submittal of documents from the applicant. Um, and so they're requesting an additional twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, to complete that work. And that would be money that would be um, requested under 53G uh, in the state building code, uh, excuse me, in the under state law. And so I had asked Mr. Haverty if this was something that we needed to come back to the to the applicant for, and he recommended that that was the appropriate way to proceed. So um, did want to just follow up with um, with Mr. Majuri as um, so the board is going to need to request this funds uh, in order to cover the expense. Um, but I just wanted to know if there was any um, concerns from your end in this regard. Um, I mean, I guess, it, you know, we, we uh, it is what it is, I guess. It would be nice to know, uh, how, you know, maybe a accounting of, of um, or just to get us comfortable with, you know, what's been spent today. I think it was $35,000 um, that, that was... <laughs> was paid in um so that we'd be out you know thirty seven thousand five hundred for you know the reviews it'd be nice to see what you know what what um what those hours entailed and and how they broke down their fees and and things of that nature mm -hmm. um if there's a, some some backup um that we i don't know if we're entitled to the backup uh, but if we had the ability to take a peek at that backup it would yeah. be appreciated so have to who's looking who's there. looking for the uh, mr chair who's looking for the additional funds uh, so that would be Davis Square Architects. Who, who please? Davis Square. But it's Davis oh. Davis Square Architects. Um, so, I, but, but I, Mr. Haverty, I believe that those um, that the the invoices can certainly be made available to the applicant. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Those would be public records. 
Okay. So the answer is the so answer I will is provide those. Oh. It is what I'll it is, request that the invoices be be forwarded to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So with that, then um, I move that the board request an additional sum of twenty five hundred dollars uh, from the applicant for ten twenty one ten twenty five Massachusetts Avenue uh, be provided and deposited into the fifty three G fund account for this project. Second. Have a second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so, so just a simple vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Brigadelli? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that is passed. So I will make sure we get the invoices off to you guys to um, cover that. The next question is when we would want to continue this hearing to. Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Apologies. Um, so what what other work would uh, Mr. Boner still have to do um, on this project? Isn't he? I mean, he, I, I can understand so, that, you know, in terms of technical, um, you know, information, you mm -hmm. know, Sean would need to provide a closeout letter from Tetra Tech, um, you know, addressing all the technical aspects of this. But, um, you know, with all due respect, you know, with, with regard to architectural, um, mm -hmm. there's really no closeout. It's, you know, he has he put forth his vision his opinions we put forth ours um you know we ended where we are now what what more with all due respect would he have to do so he's going to provide us with a final uh a final analysis of the the final set of documents we have and how they relate to the um what we have what we've requested of the applicant over the the time of the hearings um so that we're fully aware of you know we make sure that <clears throat> excuse me we have captured everything that we're looking for and that what we anticipate is in the drawings is in the drawings <clears throat> thank you <clears throat> um so then a uh, continuation of the hearing. Um, so we need to be done before April 30th or else we're gonna need to request um, additional time. I know that the Conservation Commission is meeting on, on the 20th. Um, what I don't recall was whether, was how we sort of ended up on the final report from the final set of conditions from the conservation commission do we want to have those in hand before we close the public hearing or do we want to are we comfortable closing without their final final conditions well what we, we could probably get an advanced copy but right well what i i thought what what what, what i would suggest is if the board's available for Thursday the 27th that we continue the hearing to the 27th which is still within the, the the April 30th deadline that we go to the concom on the 20th and we see if we can uh, explain that the that the anticipated last hearing for the ZBA is the 27th and if the mm -hmm. the decision is far enough along they can issue it before the 27th then we'll have it for you guys and if it, if they say that it's impossible for them to get it done by the 27th and we conclude that we really need it, then maybe we, on the 27th, we extend the, the, the time period beyond the 30th to allow for that to happen and we could figure it out on the 27th. So that's a long way of saying if the board is available and willing, I, I think we should meet on the 27th of April. Mr. Chairman, I'm not available that night. Okay. I am available on the 26th that or the 25th. Well, the uh, board, unfortunately, is 
heavily book heavily booked for the 25th and I do have a conflict on the 26th um Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? For what it's worth, I also have an, a, 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 the same conflict you do on Monday and Wednesday, but uh, on Thursday, I have a conflict uh, with another meeting that I am supposed to co-chair. And of course, that means there's somebody else in the position to chair. And if we have, if I have to choose between the obligations, I would choose this one, but Thursday is not a convenient time for me. Okay. Mr. Chair, yes. Not to pile on, but I, I'm also <laughs> unavailable. <laughs> yes. On which day? On the the twenty seventh. On, on the twenty seventh. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I the, the the challenge, just so I I put it out there, is uh, I get on a flight to Europe on Friday, February twenty eighth, for two weeks. Uh, that's why I was trying ah. to. Um, Get this last hearing in before I, 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 I leave the Commonwealth, <laughs> and it was before mm -hmm. the April thirtieth. I thought I was safe going away because thirtieth <laughs> <laughs> was a Sunday. <laughs> what yeah. if if we were to try to have? That's a highly unusual, but to do a meeting in the afternoon on the twenty seventh, would that work for anyone? I could do that. I could do that too. What time were you thinking, Mr. Chairman? I would, whatever time people can make, like four o'clock if that works, five o'clock, whatever. I, I can do basically from four to 6.30. So you could do meeting at six at 6 30 or up until 6 30. no no i could meet from from four until 6 30 uh or until 6 30 i would be available if the board was to schedule time to meet thursday at four o'clock is there any member of the board who would be unable to make that time mr chair i i would not be able to make that time i'm I'm out of the country all next week, so I'm sorry. None of these times are going to work. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I offer you a suggestion? Mr. Moore. Um, I know that you have a meeting uh, on uh, next Tuesday, which is uh, for, I believe, yes. the first meeting of the 40, other 40B project. I don't know how long that plan, that meeting is expected to go that evening, but a time certain after that, mm -hmm. folks to convene, or perhaps a little bit later than normal might work since you're already all meeting that night on a similar kind of activity. So the, the 25th, we actually got changed around a bit. So the first for the first meeting for 10 Sunnyside will be the following Tuesday on May 5th. Uh, sorry, May 2nd, Tuesday, May 2nd. Uh, we have four regular hearings scheduled for the night of the 25th. We could, assuming we could finish this up in an hour, we could meet at 6.30. It would make for a long night for the board, but we could meet at 6.30 on this matter and then meet at 7.30 on the other matters if we thought we could complete this within an hour, or we could meet at 6.00. Just trying to help. Is Tuesday a possibility? Is Tuesday a possibility for people? But six would yeah. work. Apart I have, from Mr. Rigardelli, I, I have a ZBA hearing at, at seven o'clock on my calendar already in Marblehead. I just don't know where oh. I am on the agenda. Um, mm. It's it's a it's a virtual meeting, so I could obviously do both. But if you would do it at six, um, um, I'm confident that. I could swing both. So I'm sorry, this is the 6 p.m. on the 25th, correct? This will be 6 p.m. on the 25th, 25th, correct. Good for me. I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. Books, doesn't that work for you, Paul Haverty? That works for me, but didn't, didn't one of your members say that he would be gone the entire week? 
We do have one member gone the entire week, but we do currently have uh, six members who are uh, fully, who have been at all sessions, and this would be Mr. Riccadelli's first miss, so he could mull in back in if he needed to. Okay. I, I'm free the, the entire evening on the 25th, so that's fine. This, okay. th this wouldn't prohibit it. Um, this wouldn't exclude him from the voting process, correct? So this would only no. He would have to mull it, use the Mullen rule to review the review the contents of the hearing and sign a statement that he's done so, and then he can he would be re eligible for final voting. We do have six members who have attended all the hearings, and so if we lost one, we would still have a full voting board of five members, um, regardless. And Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to do the to to review the video. Okay. Thank you. All right, then. So then, that being the case, we do not need an extension. Um, but we would need a motion to continue the public hearing for the residents of the Millbrook to Tuesday, April. 25th, and we will be at 6 p.m. I should also ask um, our administrator, Colleen, does that work for you as well? Yeah, that works for me, thanks. Cool. Okay. Right, okay, so then I move, th is there any other items we want to discuss this evening? Mr. Chairman? Then I will move. Yes, sir. Mr. Hanlon. This, this isn't another item. It's just a, is, but if we do what we're planning to do, and which I think we'll do in a, in a moment, it, it, we need to be quite efficient in how we use our time when, when this comes up. And I just encourage everyone who has red lines to get in emerging drafts and so forth to take that into consideration and try to, you know, front front load that effort as much as possible so that things are as close to final condition going in to that last to that last hearing as as uh, as possible so that we can move through through things and and uh, make sure that that we've covered everything that we need to cover in the limited time we'll have to cover it. And along those lines, Mr. Chairman, is it possible? Uh, between you and Mr. Feldman to get one document with the red line, with the edits, so that we can distinguish who's made what suggestions? I can certainly try. Um, well, let me, oh, so let's just talk about these logistics for a second. I was going to deliver a red line uh, to Mr. Haverty. Uh, probably on Wednesday now, because I want to add a few things that we yeah. talked about tonight and, and 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 get some language there so people could see it. Um, Mr. Klein, you have a red line that you're going to get to Mr. Haverty, and we were going to let Mr. Haverty um, put together a uh, consolidated draft um, and then publish that consolidated draft, presumably for us to everybody to give a look at, so that on Tuesday night, if anybody had any comments about what's in that draft, we just raise it and try to resolve it right right then and there. Um, I don't know if it matters to me if it's a if a proposed change is my change or Mr. Klein's. I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna look at the proposed change, and if we we everybody is satisfied with it, I guess the source of it doesn't matter, and if someone's not satisfied with some language, we'll wordsmith it and get it figured out on the uh, 25th. Um, I, I, so I guess I'm suggesting maybe it doesn't matter whose red line it is, as long as Mr. Haverty is able to create a red line. And I would create a red line against his original draft that was circulated originally to everybody so we could see all the cumulative changes that Mr. Klein's made, that I've made, that they're, they're going to be all in one document. Does that make any sense? It does. It puts a, 
big onus on Paul to try to put that together quickly. Um, That's fine. I can do that. Okay. Right. So we'll get that to you. Either yeah, tomorrow or first thing Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, unless there's anything further, um, I will move to continue the public hearing for the residences at Millbrook to Tuesday, April 25th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Second. Mr. Hanlon? So a vote on the board to continue. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on the residences at Millbrook to Tuesday, April 25th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice Have a nice right. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You. All right. So the board just quickly gone over our calendar. Um, as we said, we've got a meeting on the 25th now. So we have two meetings on the 25th, starting at 6 and then again at 7.30. Um, Christian, a quick question. Yeah. Should we do two separate Zooms for that? So the board would have to switch from the first one to the second so they could stop recording and restart. Oh, that's a good question. God. I honestly have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it probably does make sense to, to have two different numbers. Okay. So I'll do a different one for each meeting and then um, everybody will just have to remember to switch. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Colleen. Um, and then, yeah, so we're meeting, we have the two meetings on the 25th and then we're meeting on this Tuesday, the 2nd, which is the first meeting for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, we have no meeting on Tuesday, May 9th, but we meet again on the 23rd um and i'm assuming on the second we'll set up we'll try to set up a schedule for hearings going forward with them as well so there may be others coming in so that's that is our calendar um we're at the conclusion of the meeting are there any other questions from the board no if not i would like to th thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the arlington zoning board of appeals i appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting i would especially like to thank colleen ralston for all her help and assistance this evening and for Marissa Allow for her assistance um, in supporting the, the website. And thank you for the preparing for and hosting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by us will be available in your future. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion. To so moved. Adjourn. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Thank you, Mr. Second. DuPont. Second, yep. The vote of the board to adjourn for the evening, Mr. DuPont. Aye. DuPont. <laughs> Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Uh, uh, Mr. Hallman? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very much.